A Musical Life with arts writer and author Tom DiNardo. For 40 years, Tom DiNardo has covered the Philadelphia arts scene through his articles in the Bulletin and the Philadelphia Daily News. Tom has just published two new books, Listening to Musicians, a compilation of interviews and reflections on the conductors, musicians, and artists associated with the Philadelphia Orchestra, and Performers Tell Their Stories, where Tom gets to share stories from his interactions with artists from the classical, jazz, opera, ballet, and pop worlds. Welcome to A Musical Life. I'm Hugh Sung. Before we get started with my interview with Tom DiNardo, I have a few announcements. First, I wanted to share some news about an exciting competition for young classical musicians. Hosted by the Nellie Berman School of Music in the suburbs of Philadelphia, the Young Classical Virtuosos of Tomorrow competition is open to participants in piano, strings, wind and brass, voice, and chamber music categories with age ranges between 7 to 25, depending on the category. With over $10,000 in prizes and winners' concerts at the Kimmel Center and Westchester University, the Young Classical Virtuosos of Tomorrow competition is a wonderful opportunity for young musicians nationwide and a loving tribute to the late Nellie Berman's legacy of music education. The application deadline has just been extended to January 6th, and the age limits for the vocal and chamber music categories have been raised for applicants up to 25 years old. For more information, visit nbsmusic.com. Once again, that web address is n as in Nelly, b as in Berman, s as in school, music.com. Next, I'd like to invite you to join me for my first live streaming video event on Thursday, December 22nd, at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, when I'll be showcasing some of the amazing students from the Nellie Berman School of Music. We'll get to interview them and hear them play some wonderful music. To watch the live video concert, visit and like A Musical Life on Facebook, or sign up for our newsletter at amusicallife.com to get a link to our Facebook page. Tom, thank you so much for being on the show. I've been wanting to interview you for the longest time and finally got an excuse. Congratulations also on the publication of your two new books, Listening to Musicians and Performers Tell Their Stories. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Hugh, it's so wonderful to be with you again and I always learn so much from you musically and life-wise, so it's a real joy. <laughs> and thanks for caring about these books. Um, I found that after 40 years I had so much um, material that I hoped would be of value that uh, a dear friend who was my mentor in California suggested that it had to be two books, one about the Philadelphia Orchestra and all their conductors and um, guest soloists and the musicians in the orchestra. And that's and the book, Listening to Musicians. Listening to Musicians. Mm -hmm. And the other one, Performers Tell Their Stories, is about everything else, which <laughs> is all the recitalists, jazz players, ballet dancers, opera singers, um, opera directors, and everybody else that I was lucky enough to talk to. It's an amazing collection of behind the scenes and personal stories that you wouldn't get unless you got a chance to speak to these amazing musicians and artists and thinkers and creatives up close and personal. And many of them, most of them, if not all of them, considered you their personal friend. Well, I had, a, I had an advantage um, with the bulletin, uh, which I, where I had to do reviews for about eight years, I just sort of got my feet wet and interviewing at the end of that period, but the Daily News that I went to um, after the bulletin folded, they didn't want reviews. And consequently, uh, because they were willing to take um, some classical music stories, and they really didn't know that much about it, so I was really very fortunate in that I could do the, the kind of stories I wanted to do that may not have been typical, 
but as long as they didn't get a lot of complaints, they just let me keep doing it <laughs> because what I was concerned about the most as a, as a musician of very meager talent was to find out the, the heart and soul of these people, not so much the nitty gritty of their, which cadenza they were going to play or what piano they were using, but how did they feel about doing that and why were they doing that and what, why would they choose a particular concerto they were going to have to work three months on and how did it feel to walk onto that stage when all you had was your memory and your fingers or your instrument and I just was so interested in the, the human part of this and it seemed as though from the emails that I got back that it was working and since they didn't complain I just kept doing it and kept refining it and asking these artists questions that normally they didn't get asked and I found that when artists know that you care about them and you weren't assigned them but you really had done your homework um, I remember one time being at a place where I didn't interview it's off Perlman but I heard him say once that he had been in London and the cub reporter had said to him, so you're a fiddle player, right? <laughs> and that taught me to learn everything possible that was written about those artists. So they didn't have to tell you that stuff that they had said a hundred times. What I wanted, and, and that gave you the opportunity to ask them stuff to make them realize that you really knew about them and you didn't need to know about the basic stuff you wanted to know much deeper mm. about their emotions and that's what i cared about and that's what i hope comes through in the books it's wonderful that with caring you really delve much deeper as you just mentioned into the artists lives and i think when the artists sense that you have taken the time to know them more deeply than the typical interviewer they're much more prone to share more with you because of their appreciation and your books are full of these very intimate responses and, and interactions with these musicians again as i've mentioned that go beyond just interviews and delve in, and start to develop into very deep friendships in many cases well in the in listening to musicians the book about the philadelphia orchestra when your beat is um is classical music you get an opportunity through the years to speak to the conductors and they get to know you. And somebody like Ricardo Muti or Savalish or Christoph Eschenbach, once they realize that you're not out to savage them because you're not reviewing them, I found that they tended to be much more open about the way that they felt about things. And they were much more willing to talk about how they felt about what they did because there was no particular threat involved. And they just felt comfortable with you after a while, and um, uh, this was a this was a, a tremendous advantage, I think, when you know you're not criticizing them, you're not judging them, you're not reviewing them. You just want to know, you know, how do you how did you feel about this? And nobody asked them this. And um, in the other book, performers tell their stories. Um, there was some great advantage. I remember. We went up to interview Betty Comden and Adolph Green, the great, the great Broadway librettists, and they were so interested in some of the questions that, that he got up and did the whole first act of On the 20th Century for me in his <laughs> living room. And, uh, and um, I remember having supposedly 15 minutes with Renee Fleming and getting about an hour and a half wow. because she saw that I had maybe... 50 questions and she said oh my gosh i i'll give you short answers and she just told me some amazing things about what it's like when you're at the top of your craft and people expect tremendous lot from you like i remember she said that sometimes she would wake up in the middle of the night and say oh my god i have to sing dove sono for the marriage of figaro and she had just sung rossini's uh, Armida, which has about 50,000 bel canto high notes, and she said, oh, I'd rather do that four times than sing that one aria. Mm. Now, and, and I remember saying, but when you sing that aria, it just feels like we just sort of cracked the door into your dressing room and, and, and we just heard you do a soliloquy to your mirror. And I remember she said, do you know how many years it took me to make it sound like that? <laughs> 
And you know, you have to really respect somebody like that who's trying to tell you what it's like to be on top and everybody expects you to be always great, how difficult a pressure that must be. And, and I remember David Kim saying to me, um, the great concertmaster of the Philadelphia Orchestra, that when the guys in the orchestra play a solo, their toughest audience are the 99 people behind them who really know whether they're playing well and that soloists who come have played that concerto 50 times with other orchestras. But yet, he said, whenever they come, the first thing that they do is they shake his hand and they're always clammy. <laughs> you know, you're going to play a Brahms concerto or a Beethoven concerto or something. Sure. It is a scary thing. And, and frankly, Hugh, my intention in both of these books was to try to give to the general reader who's not a musician or who's not a great performer an insight into what those people are like so they're not just somebody on the stage in a tuxedo or somebody on the stage in a costume, but they're just real people and all they're doing is they're communicating in the way that's natural for them, the way a painter paints or a writer writes. It's just their way of doing it. And I found through emails that people um, who normally didn't go to concerts would go to a concert and write me because the person sounded so interesting that they felt like, how boring could it be? <laughs> you know, we've been to the zoo and the art museum and so forth, so let's try this crazy thing. And then they would really like it because I found that the hard part is to get them there because in Philadelphia, with the level of, the level of creative artistry in the ballet and the opera and the music and the chamber music around town, that what I have learned is once they go once, that's it. They're, they're hooked. The hard part is to get them there. I wonder if you could spend a few moments talking about the sometimes adversarial relationship between artists and reviewers or critics. And you touched on that very briefly in terms of the way that you approach these artists, which is much kinder, I would say, than what artists are afraid that they'll get from a typical reviewer. Can you speak a little bit to the, the relationship between the reviewer, the critic of a, of a paper, but, you know, which is in decline at this point. There are fewer and fewer reviewers, but why do you think there's such adversary, do you think, between the artists and the people who make a living writing about their performances and about them? When I was doing the bulletin reviews, very few of which are in either book, I was probably an easy critic because if it was particularly new music that I got sent on a lot of, it was strictly a matter of sensing that someone was really trying to communicate with me as compared with somebody who was particularly facile and who was knocking out a commission. I found it was really easy to tell. Mm. And I think you want to feel as though somebody is really trying to tell you something beautiful they heard in their head instead of just somebody who just happens to have skill but nothing to say. As far as in the, the daily news periods of time where I wasn't doing reviews, I found that it's very difficult, I think, um, in when you're reviewing a great, great orchestra, for instance, like the Philadelphia Orchestra, in a, in a regional orchestra where you might have um, good days and bad days, uh, I think a reviewer really um, is useful, especially if there are more than one paper, so that you have conflicting views. Like, for instance, when the Inquirer and the Bulletin both had reviews, sometimes we agreed, sometimes we horribly disagreed. And that was kind of fun mm -hmm. and instructive, I think, for the reader. But what happens is when you have a great orchestra like the Philadelphia Orchestra, a reviewer is in the position of, of being what in the sports pages a writer would be called a homer. A homer is a guy on a sports page who is always making excuses for his team. In other words, we lost 17 to 1, but the but there was a glary sun or, or somebody didn't feel well that day or something. The orchestra is kind of the same thing because they play so well that there really isn't that much to write about that doesn't sound like last week's review. Mm -hmm. So you hope for um, a new piece because there's something to write about. 
uh, a new artist that hasn't been here before that's something to write about. But I think what happens is, I think it's very awkward to be saying, boy, they played wonderfully this week, boy, they played wonderfully this week. <laughs> so what happens is, mm. I think there's much more, there's much more intention when some small thing goes wrong to mention it because that's the only thing there is to write about. And consequently, if somebody clams a horn solo or somebody comes in wrong or something over the period of a two-hour concert and that's mentioned, you know, this is the kind of thing that I think could cause some distress to the players <laughs> who 99% of the time are superb players. Mm -hmm. But really, uh, it's really a difficult, it's a difficult challenge for a reviewer. Mm -hmm. It really is. Uh, you just don't want to say the same thing week after week. Um, if you were reviewing the Podunk Philharmonic and they really had a good time one week and the next week they were abysmal, that would be a lot easier to write about mm. than to write about something that's always at a very high level all that's the time. Interesting. <laughs> Could you speak a little bit to your own personal music background? I mean, in the years that I've known you, Tom, I, I have been so amazed at the breadth and depth of your musical insight and knowledge, and you speak with more authority than most musicians, professional musicians I know. Your, it, your knowledge is incredible. Tell us a little bit about your musical upbringing, your musical background, and how you came to be so knowledgeable about music. My dad was very, very poor, and he was given a beat-up old violin once, and he used to follow the funeral processions down Broad Street and try to fake it by ear. And he used to go to the opera and come home and on our upright piano and, and, and play the parts and sing the parts. And he must have gotten maybe 50% of it. But years and years later, I heard operas and said, I've heard this before because I remember him playing it. Um, I unfortunately studied with my uncle, who was a church organist who came over the house after church because of the possibility that there was possibly some vermouth. And he, <laughs> and he taught me this horrible, horrible old Schumann method of high fingers oh, and no. all that. And, and I just hated it and, um, and didn't really practice again or play until years later when I had an opportunity to study with Temple Painter, who just died who was a wonderful, wonderful, incredible man. And he played the harpsichord for the Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia for about 40 years. Um, and that was like starting all over again. I remember he said, you can't play like that. You have to do it completely differently with your hands. And I want you to do this. And what's going to happen is your knuckles are going to hurt for a couple of weeks. And then your forearm, your your wrist is going to hurt for a couple of weeks, and then your elbow is going to hurt for a while, and then your shoulders are going to hurt for a while, and then your hips are going to hurt for a while, and then you're going to feel it in your legs, and then you'll be okay. And it really <laughs> was true. It really was true. And I finally, he said, your, your hand, your, your arm is stronger than your fingers. Mm -hmm. So when you're playing a, a run or a rolled chord, you know, what you were doing was horribly wrong. <laughs> and it was true. Um, now, you were taking lessons with him as an adult. Well, yeah, as an adult. I mean, I didn't really start with him until I was maybe 30 years old. And um, after I stopped with him, I met Jimmy Amity, who was the famous jazz player who wasn't a jazz player anymore because, because, of, because of boxing and sports and of playing too much. He had just ruined his hands, um, and he taught... Um, with he taught jazz with his hands in two champagne buckets of ice, and uh, and he found that uh, he taught me that the the key to jazz was that the that instead of everything in four, every beat was in three, and you had to play the beat on the triplet upbeat, or else it was really really square. And I found that after three or four years. I was doing okay, but whenever it got really fast or really hard and I played on the, on the beat, he would just scream. <laughs> and it was really hard for him. It was harder for him than it was for me because he couldn't play. And uh, Jimmy finally took shots 
therapy, acupuncture, and he went to the art museum and he played one concert before he died. It was the first time he had played in public for 40 years. Wow. It was amazing. Wow. And it just showed me how, it was just one more example of how much people sacrifice for the art of what they do. I mean, it was just amazing for him to be sitting there listening to students and not be able to play. Uh, how incredible that was, and it made you want to do so well because you realized how painful it was for him. Mm -hmm. And so I was really blessed with these two great, very, very, very different teachers. But you know, um, you still have to have, you still have to have an innate natural skill uh, for it, and, which I don't. And there's a there's a matter of no matter how much you practice, there's a limit that somebody like you, Q, doesn't have. And so you try to play the few things that you really love and try to do them the best you can. It must be intimidating to yourself because you know so much about music. Is it frustrating and intimidating to try to play and learn to play? Or are you able to still appreciate the joy of making music even though your own personal ear standards are so high from being exposed to the best of the best. Well, you might remember, Hugh, that I tried to practice the, the Brahms Intermezzo almost every day, yes. and I hardly got it, although I, I did play it pretty well when I was with Temple. But one day you came over and you just sight read it better than I will ever play it, <laughs> and that is intimidating. <laughs> Certainly it is. And that's one of the things that there are many, many stories in, in the performers tell their stories, which is much more personal personal and uh, with a lot more humor and a lot more goofy personal stories in which a lot of times the the end of the story is there are people who play the piano and then there are musicians <laughs> and there are lots lots of those stories i'd like to spend a few moments in each book a bit um, and then i want to return a little bit more to your origin stories more in terms of from the perspective of a layperson who doesn't know anything about music beyond what they hear perhaps on the radio or through iTunes or streaming online. In listening to musicians, the bo book that focuses on your stories about covering the Philadelphia Orchestra for about 40 years or so, can you help our listeners, again, who have Many have never been to an orchestra concert. What makes the Philadelphia Orchestra so special? And you, you already mentioned that they're such a remarkable orchestra. Intimidate the soloists that come to play with them. But for the average person who's never been to a live orchestra concert, what makes the Philadelphia Orchestra so unique and such a treasure in our city? Well, the tradition has gone on since the the Stokowski years and the Ormandy years, and I think anybody that joins that orchestra feels very deeply, and, and a lot of them are from Curtis, of course, and who actually studied with people who are in the orchestra or used to be in the orchestra, and that legacy has worked out exactly as though it was designed. And they feel, I, I've, I think that I can, I'm fair in saying this, that they feel that legacy very strongly of that orchestra sound. Now, nobody really knows what the orchestra sound is, and I believe that the orchestra sound, in a lot of cases, during Stokowski's day, and replicated a little bit today, was that the sound in the Academy of Music was so dead that the only way to get out was for everybody to play forte all the time, <laughs> which was the Philadelphia sound. And also, I think Stokey allowed free bowing which made it even a bigger string sound. As opposed to everybody, all the strings everybody being playing, synchronized. The right, same synchronized, which of course they now do. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was true because um, whenever they would go to Carnegie Hall, they would have to learn to play mezzo forte or mezzo piano because they were just used to playing loud all the time mm -hmm. in the academy because it was dead. And believe me, when Ricardo Muti said that the sound was not good, the, the Philadelphia old... Old guard did not want to hear that coming from him, but it's absolutely true. It's an opera house, and this and nobody could record in there. Um, RCA, Columbia, Sony, nobody could get a good sound out of the Academy of Music. Mm. They always recorded in 
in other halls around Philadelphia. And you actually covered that story in your book in terms of um, the quest to, go, to build an entirely new concert hall, to move out of the Academy of Music and into what is now the Kimmel Center. Well, you as, should... as you know, there was, a, there was another plan to build a smaller hall at Broad and Spruce, and that got, that got scratched. And truly, some of the people who were people who were supporters of the orchestra who were supposed to have voted for it and be for it did everything possible to avoid that, to avoid moving. I mean, it took a lot. It took Rendell and Mrs. Rendell to actually get past the, 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 the inertia of staying in the academy because to a lot of people, the academy was wonderful, and it is, and they didn't see any reason to move. But the whole idea was to free up the academy for the opera and the ballet and for traveling shows, which is exactly what has happened. I mean, imagine the opera company, when the orchestra played in the academy, actually had to rent lights for every show. Mm -hmm. And they had to work around all the rehearsals. So if the orchestra had a rehearsal in the morning, they had to wait until the rehearsal was over, take everything down, put the sets up, do a quick rehearsal, and then take everything down for the orchestra's rehearsal the next day. Oh my goodness. And this was really, really tough. So now the, the opera is free to go in for a week or two, and the ballet is able to do this, whereas before they could only sneak in for very small rehearsal time. And it made it very difficult. This was the whole plan, and it, and it worked. But there were a lot of people who tried very hard to keep everything in the academy. Mm. That's that's the that's the Philadelphia old guard for you. What were the keys to the success of moving forward with such a visionary plan to build an entirely new hall, given all this resistance? What do you think were the secrets of making this work? What what, what do you attribute to that? You had mentioned uh, Governor Ed Rendell and his wife being key players in making this happen. What were some of the other ingredients to making this dream a reality? Well, Kimmel came up with the original $10 million, and because of his success and the mayor's enthusiasm about this, I think that they really couldn't ignore this possibility anymore. And even though the thing cost, you know, I forget, two or 300000 and his was only a, a, a sort of a drop in the bucket in the big picture. Um, you know, $300 million. You know, yeah. um, you know it, it, it made it, something really serious and and it just got the ball rolling a lot faster um as far as the the philadelphia sound um that you asked about before the in, the intention of the musicians is to retain the sound that they heard when they came to the orchestra when they were younger so what happens is there is a there's a kind of a wonderful musical memory that they all have of what the orchestra sounded like from those records from those records and uh, i think it's sort of part of the dna of even young people that come into that orchestra that know that they're part of a sort of an ongoing long 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 time tradition that stakovsky started and of course ormandy kept it up for 44 years or so and for a long long time uh, to people all around the world, the recordings that came out were the Philadelphia Orchestra recordings under Ormandy. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the gold standard. I think I'd spend a little bit of time in your other book, Performers Tell Their Stories, because you open up the book with a, an almost hard-to-believe way in which you got your start in journalism. I believe from a seance session. You mind telling us a little bit how you got your start as a journalist? It's an incredible story. Oh sure, I, I was <laughs> I was writing for a for a paper called the Drummer, which was a really wonderful alternative paper. And how um, old were you at the time? Oh, I was, I guess, in my late twenties. And I did a, a, in fact, there's a cartoon in there that I did with a friend who was a cartoonist. I did the jokes for her for a long time. And she did this, this, uh, this goofy thing called Arf and Annie about a beautiful girl and a dog. And it was all about the political stuff that was going on at the time in Philadelphia. But um, I had a piano tuner 
who was from Baghdad, and one time he invited me to a seance, and I didn't know <laughs> what that was about. And I went to a place, and there was a guy in a in a whole regalia outfit with candles and incense, <laughs> and uh, and supposedly he was some Balinese guy, and uh, and Jim Felton was there, who at the time was the the music critic for the Philadelphia Bulletin, Evening Bulletin, and I had never met Jim, so. He said, we're going to use a Ouija board. And I thought this was hilarious because when I was a kid, my Aunt Julie used to do a Ouija board with a funny looking hat. And she's like the least mysterious person on the planet. <laughs> and um, I kind of thought the Ouija board was kind of cool when I was a little kid until it started telling me to eat green vegetables. <laughs> and then I figured that Aunt Julie was not connected with the spiritual world. Yeah. <laughs> But um, he asked Jim questions about his, his family, and the thing just almost pulled me off the board. And I thought Jim was doing it. He thought I was doing it. It was really a very scary event. I mean, that thing just, you, you know, you're only putting your finger on this thing. And it just kept wanging over to no. And Jim said, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm sorry. And the guy didn't understand it. It turned out that Jim had had a very distressing childhood. He found his father hung in a ballpark when he was about 14, and, wow. and, and these things just brought up stuff that, and he reacted, and he thought that I had been doing it, and I thought he had been doing it, but maybe I believe in a Ouija board after all, but I drove him home, he didn't talk about it, and he said that he was writing a book about Leopold Stokowski, and he had a whole room of background material and he said he was so close to it that he just couldn't do it. And he wondered if I would ghostwrite it. So I did one chapter, which was the chapter when, when Stokowski um, sort of pulled a fast one on the daughter of um, the Cincinnati Symphony's um, president, who had met him as an organist in London, and he sweet-talked her into being the conductor in Cincinnati, and it was a finite two-year period. Um, and I did it, and he liked it. And um, a couple of weeks later, he called me, and he said somebody had stolen it out of his had stolen it out of his drawer at the Bulletin, and he said he was selling the whole repository of Stokowski information to someone else to write the book. And two years later, he called me and said, "Would you like to do a review?" Hmm. And that's how you got your story. And I needed yeah. the money, so I went, and I went to the first review, and they forgot to tell them that I was coming, <laughs> so I had to pay for the tickets, oh, so, no. I, so I lost money on the deal. <laughs> but it was Cynthia Rehm, so it was really okay. Wow, wow. And uh, Cynthia Rehm accompanying a baritone, so it was okay. <laughs> and, and in bulletin days, I got to review everything that no one wanted to do. Um, it was either on a Sunday, it was out of town, um, it was something that uh, it was the leftover stuff, and uh, I got to do some really crazy stuff and figure out on the job. And when you would get back to the paper in those days, uh, in those days concerts started at eight thirty, so you'd get back to the paper about eleven or eleven fifteen, and the copy editors would be screaming and screaming at you to get the story in. And in the early days, you wrote on five-page paper on these old typewriters. And so if you wanted to move paragraphs around, you couldn't unless you retyped it. You didn't have time. Yeah. And then they were screaming, screaming, screaming at you to get the story in. And you would write the story and hand it to them. And then they would make you stand there while they edited news stories for half an hour till they got to yours. So it was... Um, you know, you get home at two two thirty in the morning, oh my goodness. and it was um, it was blood money. Mm. It was good experience, mm. and I'm glad I did it. But um, doing overnights was not fun. Yeah. 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 Was not fun. I want to jump ahead a little bit to talk about. Well, I want, eventually I want to get to the story of how you and I started to work together. You have always been so generous. Uh, not only in your interviews and your writing, but even in your altruism and trying to help other musicians get their voices heard. A couple of people that come to mind are 
the conductor Joanne Paletta, who you championed and actually helped um, with the production of, I believe, at least one or, one or more of her albums, as well as um, a wonderful singer that you introduced me to. I wonder if you could share some of your stories from the work that you've done to try to help produce some wonderful albums, some selections of which we're going to listen to. What I have found in these many years is something that's very difficult to express. Something that I've found in doing these books is that it's very difficult for me, actually, because I'm really much better at other people's projects than I am at my own. <laughs> um, other people's projects um, are fun and they are satisfying. Um, my own projects are are much more difficult because I'm not a natural salesman or I don't have enough chutzpah to actually push these books and just hope that people will like them. But way back um, when I was studying with Temple and also Harold Boatwright, the composer who lived upstairs, um, they asked me once to, if I had a recorder, that I could copy this um, aria from an opera by a friend of theirs. And I had recording equipment, so I went out there to Powhatan Village and recorded this aria from an opera that I thought was very beautiful. And the composer's name was Romeo Cascarino, and his wife was Dolores Cascarino. And she sang beautifully, and I didn't think anything about it. And years later, I was asked to review in the Drexel, in that cavernous Drexel Hall at 31st and Chestnut, um, a sight read performance of his opera called William Penn that he had been working on for 24 years, I found. Um, and it was um, not staged and it was, it was not really played well. They didn't have much rehearsal and it was, and it was uh, horrible acoustics. And I did the best I could with that. That was in 1975. And then in 1977, it was done again in the same hall. It wasn't a lot better. But the composer gave me cassettes of that performance. And I remember listening to it one night on the way back home from Boston and, and hearing through the mistakes and realizing how wonderful and beautiful a piece that was, realizing that he was writing very tonal, very melodic aria and duet kind of music at a time during the 50s and 60s when nobody was writing that kind of tonal music. And he was just sort of out there all alone mm. and nobody cared about music like that. And eventually, eventually I was able to produce, um, produce the opera at the Academy of Music and it went on thanks to the fact that, that in October 1982 happened to be a big celebration of the city and the 300th anniversary of its founding by Penn. And the last scene, of course, is the treaty scene with the Indians that founded Philadelphia. So fortunately, I got some civic input into that. And they let it go on with two big performances at the Academy. Um, it turned out that the, the person who designed the sets was Swiss. And in Switzerland, the government pays for the sets and he designed five titanic sets that needed, each one needed to be in a tractor trailer outside, which meant that there was about an eight minute, uh, eight minute break in between scenes of an act. Um, but we got it on and it was fine. And um, after he died, um, one time I interviewed Joanne Folletta who conducts the Buffalo Philharmonic, the Buffalo Philharmonic and the Virginia Symphony. And he, she was here to conduct the Philadelphia Orchestra at the Man. And we had a wonderful conversation and she was very friendly. And I did something that's very rude to a conductor. I said, would you listen to this music? Now, only one of Cascarino's orchestral mu pieces of music had been recorded. And one was sight read by a German orchestra on an old LP. And I made it onto a cassette and gave it to her. And she said, um, is there more? And I said, yes, there are four orchestral pieces and a couple of smaller pieces. And she said, let's do it for Noxos. And I couldn't believe it. Wow. So 
the widow and I um, tried our best to raise the money and to get enough money to hire 78 people. And uh, at, um, at one point when we were trying to raise the money, we decided that she would sing a recital in her hometown of Bristol, where everybody knew her and where she sang, you know, for every conceivable church service, funeral, wedding, and everything else. And um, what we needed was a pianist. <laughs> and it so happens that for some reason, you and I had a conversation, and um, I asked if you would play one of the pieces, uh, which was um, a, uh, a bassoon sonata that Romeo had written um, when he came out of the army for, the, for his army buddy, who was the Philadelphia Orchestra's bassoon, principal bassoon, uh, Sal Schoenbach. And um, Danny Matsukawa of the Philadelphia Orchestra suggested one of his students to play the bassoon part. And I came to you and asked if you knew somebody who would play the piano part. And you said, let me hear the piece. And I played you the piece. And you said, what else is going to be on the program? And I said, well, it's going to be uh, his eight songs for Dolores. And you said, let me hear them. And, uh, and you said, you know what? Let me play the whole concert. <laughs> and I remember calling Dolores, and she just completely broke down in tears Aww. knowing who you were. Aww. And you did come and play it. And uh, also um, the first half, some operatic arias. And we played the, um, the tape of the, um, of the final choruses. And, um, and that helped to get to the point where Joanne came to my son's church in Germantown, and she did the recording and uh, in four days, and it was great. And uh, it was a great experience. And those are the kind of experiences that are more fun for me than my own stuff. Because, um, you know, when you, when William Penn went on and we sat in the academy and Romeo took my hand and that curtain went up mm -hmm. to realize that sometimes if you work hard at it, you have the possibility to make someone's dream come true. It's the greatest feeling in the world. And it's so much better than anything that could happen to you. That's just, that's one thing I learned from that experience. That was just, you know, one of the great moments.
I'll never forget that. The, the tears of joy that I remember from Dolores. Um, your incredibly generous spirit in wanting to lift other people up. And it comes through in your writing and uh, the way you treat all of the stories and all the people, even the humorous ones, with such love and respect and admiration. It shines through really in every page. And I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to turn the tables on you and promote you and have your project to get out into the world. And I hope everybody gets a chance to check out both of these books. Is there anything else that you'd like to share in, in closing? One thing I remember, Hugh, about you is that <laughs> when you were rehearsing the eight songs called Pathways of Love that he wrote for um, she had sung them many times with her husband, but she had never sung them with anybody else. And so when you rehearsed and you did the first one, um, she had never heard it by anybody else. And she just, um, I went to the rehearsal and she just, tears were coming down her face. And I remember she hugged you and said, I can't believe you understand exactly what my husband wanted because you got it. Now, some his music um, sounds very mellifluous, but they say it's hard to play. And um, you got it, and that made her, that, that gave her great joy, and that was a beautiful moment. One thing I want to say about the books is that listening to musicians about the Philadelphia Orchestra is almost completely about what other people had to say because I was lucky to be able to interview all these people, especially the musicians in the orchestra. Uh, the other book, Performers Tell Their Stories, has a lot of interviews in it as well by other folks, by, by dancers and singers and recitalists and jazz players and all kinds of people. But there's more of a, there's, there are more stories in which I'm involved because the more that I wrote it, the more I realized that there was a lot of funny and weird and humorous stuff that happened to me that I just had to put into the book um, that had something to do with either journalism or music. And um, there were just some things that I just couldn't leave out. And so um, I think what happens is you could say listening to musicians is pretty serious about the music business in the Philadelphia Orchestra. And performers tell their stories has some serious parts, but there's also some goofy parts in it too. <laughs> and, the, and, and we hope that they would make people laugh at some of the crazy experiences I was lucky enough to find myself in. All right, to close the interview, would you mind sharing one of the craziest experiences that you recount in your book? Of course, since I was doing mostly these interviews with musicians and dancers and singers. This wasn't really what I consider journalism because these were just interviews and real reporters were the guys who went up to somebody and said, why did you steal that money? Or how does it feel that your kid got run over? Or things like that, that were really tough reporters. But I wasn't really doing that. Well, there used to be the Pavarotti competitions here in Philadelphia. And the problem with the Pavarotti competition was these people would come from all over the world and they would sing and it was fun and it was wonderful to hear them. And Pavarotti would knock it down to about 35 or 40 people and he would say, they all win. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and what happened was that, you know, singers said they would go to their agent and said, I won the Pavarotti competition. And they would say, well, who didn't? <laughs> so it really wasn't that great. And after a few years of spending tremendous lots of money on this, the only thing the opera company got out of it was that that people who won were going to be able to sing for free in future shows. So it wasn't anything that was making them a lot of money. And at one point, they decided they weren't going to do it anymore. I happened to be in the office, and the editor, Zach Stolberg, said, um, they're canceling the Pavarotti competition. I said, really? He said, find out. And I thought, how am I going to find out? So somebody said, well, call his agent, um, who was known to be a really, really, really difficult guy. And I called him, and he said, uh, I told him what I wanted. He says, I don't know where Pavarotti is. And if I knew, I wouldn't tell you, SOB. 
<laughs> and I thought, what am I going to do? So I had friends at Variety, and I called them, Variety newspaper, and I said, you know where Pavarotti is? We'll call you back. They called me back and said, um, he's in Dortmund, Germany. He's giving a concert tonight. Oh, okay. Um, is there a four-star hotel in... Uh, I'll call you back. Yeah, there's a Hilton. You have the phone number? We'll call you back. <laughs> so I call, and I figure there's no, no chance, but at least I can say I tried. And I call, and I say, uh, um, Guten Tag, could I speak to Mr. Pavarotti, please? Just a moment, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I hear, Pronto! I said, Luciano, it's Tommaso in Philadelphia. Ah, Tommaso goes now. And he, to oh, oh, he told me all about how he loved Philadelphia. They were going to come back and do it again. And there wasn't going to be the opera company. And we were going to raise the money and all this stuff. And he told me all this wonderful stuff. And then he said, but um, uh, I have to go now and sing a concert, Tom. <laughs> okay? I said, grazie, Luciano. He says, sure. So I write it up. I've run down to the paper. And I think uh, I go to the day editor. And I said, I got the... I got the story of the decade. And he said, how long is it? I said, it's 12 inches. And he said, hey, Harry, I got something for that hole on 22. <laughs> so what happens is that's the difference between reporting, okay, and what I did, which was not reporting. <laughs> Tom, thank you so much for spending time sharing these wonderful stories. Thank you so much for all that you've contributed to the artistic and musical life here in Philadelphia, and thank you most of all for your friendship. It's been such an honor to know you and to, um, to call you a friend, and uh, I'm looking forward to the pizza parties, your annual pizza parties that have become quite famous in musical circles, and it's an honor to be invited to your next one. Thank you, Hugh. It's been my joy. It's always a joy to be with you. For links to Tom's books, visit the show notes at amusicallife.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter to get the latest updates on future episodes. You can also subscribe to A Musical Life through iTunes or with your favorite podcast playing app and get new episodes automatically downloaded onto your smartphone, tablet, or computer. If you enjoy these stories about making music and the things that move our souls, please tell a friend about this show and consider posting a short review on iTunes at amusicallife.com forward slash review. Thank you for your support. I should mention that I'll be taking a two-week hiatus for the holidays. So, until next time, I'm Hugh Sung, wishing you a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a happy, healthy, and musical life.